Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. So in this video, I want to talk to you about three acoustic effects that you never get rid of, no matter how much treatment you put in your studio. I think this is one of the the mis big misconceptions and also where, where we get a big mismatch in terms of expectations is what you can actually actually expect your room to do for you or rather what you can't expect the room to do for you once you get started with treatment or even when you get really far down the rabbit hole of treatment. How well can you actually control the environment acoustically that you're in? And it turns out there are just some things that no matter how much you do, you will never be able to get rid of. Three effects in particular. So that's what I wanna to talk to you about. Let's jump right in. The first of the three effects is the floor reflection, okay? You've heard about this. I'm sure you've thought about this. It's pretty simple. We've got the speaker, we've got the listening position. The sound comes from the speaker, hits your ear, but there's also a reflection that bounces off the floor back to your ear. And this just means that you'll get an associated comb filter, basically. Obviously, peaks and dips with the main dip usually focused around sort of 100 to 130 hertz, depending on where how, how far your speakers are from your ear. And as you move around, that will shift a bit. So you won't be able to get a fully consistent low end no matter how much treatment you do. Because obviously the floor reflection isn't something that you can really treat effectively. We don't really put absorption material on the floor to deal with this because that's usually where you're sitting and where your desk is located. So it's not really something that you can get rid of. Now, in practice, it doesn't always fully show up because depending on the size of your desk and depending on your speaker, this effect might be reduced a bit. So there are certain aspects of or just certain parts of the, the, the structure in front of you, your desk mainly, that can break up this floor reflection to some extent. But it still usually appears and there's just not much you can do about it. Even if you've got standing waves fully under control, even if you've got speaker boundary interferences fully under control, if you've got all types of reflections under control, sides, ceiling, all walls basically, the floor usually remains because we don't really treat it. And so this is the first of the three effects that you just can't get rid of. Now, if you want to dive a bit deeper into this, it's easy enough to Google for a floor balance ref a reflection calculator. I've got one here on mailau.net, which I'll post, uh, which I'll link in the in the resources section in the description. And so you can see here, for example, if I enter values typical for a home studio with the, um, the driver of your speaker being maybe four feet, about 120 centimeters above the floor, ear height is roughly the same. You got about maybe 130 centimeters. So again, four, four and a half feet between the speakers and your ear, you end up with the first cancellation at around 120 Hertz. Yeah? If you look at the impulse response, you also find a peak roughly four milliseconds after the direct sound. If you wanna go even deeper than that, I'll also link this. This is the floor balance calculator by Merlin Van Veen. Maybe you've heard me talk about him before, really an excellent educator. And he's got this Excel sheet, which I've opened here in LibreOffice, so it doesn't display quite properly. Usually there's a nice picture of a, a microphone and a speaker here, but you can kind of enter the same values. And as you can see, we get the same numbers. So again, about four milliseconds of time difference between the direct sound and the, uh, the, the reflection. And then the first dip at around 120 hertz. The great thing about this calculator is that it tells you a whole lot of other stuff on top of that if you really if you really go to want to go down the rabbit hole. So for example, you can see that it automatically calculates the bounce path, so the the total path that the reflection takes. It also tells us how much lower in volume that reflection is once it reaches the ear. It tells us the first peak that comes after the first dip and it tells us something about the actual size of the comb filter that gets created and all that gets displayed here in this graph right here, which unfortunately isn't too legible because LibreOffice doesn't, <laughs> doesn't display this, uh, this Excel file properly. But so that's the first effect that you really can't ever properly get rid of. You can reduce it to some extent, um, but it's something that will just be part of the sound 
in your studio, no matter how much treatment you do. The second effect that you can't get rid of is the desk reflection. And you've heard me talk about this before as well. Basically, it's the same idea as with the floor reflection, except in this case, the sound bounces off of the desk and then reaches your ear. Yeah, And so typically the paths involved are slightly shorter, which means that the comb filter gets created higher up in frequency, but it's also usually pretty strong simply because the, the, the sound is much louder. It doesn't have to travel so far, so it's relatively loud in comparison to the direct sound. That ratio is much lower, I guess. And so, um, and so the effect is usually quite pronounced. And if you want to check or understand more about that, have a look at the video I recently did with Head Audio where I displayed or I tested this in practice, the, the, the desk reflection to show you just how strong it is, but also what you can really do about it. So if you if you want to you want to understand more about the desk reflection and how you can get rid of that or how you can you can uh, at least do some something about it, then have a look at that video. I'll also link it in the card. And then the final effect that you can't ever get rid of is simple interference between your two speakers. Obviously, we're working in stereo at the very minimum, and so we've always got two speakers usually playing the same information, at least for anything that's mono or, or tending towards mono in the, in the material that we're playing. And so the speakers will play the same signal and depending on where your head is located, you will get interference between these two signals, right? And again, this, this is because of the distances involved, this is a, a comb filter that is higher up in frequency usually, but it's also pretty noticeable. And the, the, the easiest way to test that or to, to, to just check it out for yourself is to play some mono pink noise and then just move your head and see what happens, uh, how the actual sound changes. It will basically sound like you've put a flanger or like a chorus on that pink noise, which is the, the, the comb filter that gets created from the interference of those two signals. Yeah? Another way to, 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 to see this in practice is if you measure your speakers together, here's one that I did, uh, or one from my customers, one of my clients, um, in which we took in the, at, the starting, at the starting point of the process of treating the room. So this is just the left speaker in red and then the left plus the right speaker in this dark blue line. And as you can see, there's that sort of that big dip that happens around six kilohertz and then another one really high up. It's basically a comb filter that's got created because as this person was doing the measurement, the microphone wasn't perfectly centered between the two speakers. And so a comb filter was created, right? So again, there, there you can see that in practice and it's it's pretty obvious viewed like this. But to understand it or to get an impression of how strong this effect is for yourself, I recommend you just play some pink noise, move your head around and see how that filter, that comb filter actually affects and, and flanges, courses out the, the sound as you move your head. It's pretty interesting. So those are the three effects that you can't ever get rid of no matter what treatment you do, right? Obviously the floor reflection, we can't put insulation material on the floor. With the desk reflection, you can't really work with a big chunk of insulation material right in front of you on your desk. You need space for your gear, for your, at the very least for your, your computer keyboard and your mouse, right? And then the third one, which you literally can't do anything about is just the interference you get because you're working on two speakers, right? So we've got these three effects with one focused mainly on the low end and then two focused on kind of the upper mid range and the high end that will mess up your frequency response. No matter how much treatment you've put in the room, it's just never going to change. And I think this is, is maybe a bit humbling at the beginning, but it's, it's, it's important to understand, to, to be realistic about what you can achieve with acoustics in a studio, in a home studio in particular, but in any studio really. And that this idea of just treating your room and then ending up with perfect sound, it's, it, it just doesn't happen that way. It doesn't work that way. You always have to deal with certain acoustic effects in your day-to-day -day work because you're working in a real room with a real floor, with a desk in front of you and two speakers. And with that, let me wrap up this video. But quickly before I let you go, I have a 
home studio treatment framework for you if you are in the process of treating your studio and you're kind of in the weeds you're missing the bigger picture and you really want to kind of look at this process from a bit of a top level perspective and understand what the main steps are that you are actually following as you go through the treatment of your studio because it can be a bit confusing what to focus on first what to pay attention to what are the, the important things to put your energy into as you're treating your studio and so i've created this home studio treatment framework my five steps to systematically treat your room and get it to translate which you can download at the link in the description so again if you are in the process of treating your studio and you want to understand more about or you want, to, you want a detailed understanding of what the steps are that you should follow, in my opinion, then download the Home Studio Treatment Framework at the link in the description. So with that, let's keep learning to trust our ears and get back to having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.